Okay, good morning, everyone. And uh, welcome to class. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Everyone's able to hear me clearly? Other than the person students, the online students? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Kennedy. Okay. Thank you. Uh, sorry, we, we began uh, two minutes late. Uh, can one of you please lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? Abhishek, you like to lead us in prayer? Sure, Pastor. Thank you. Holy Father, we come before Holy Princess right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you for this class, Lord. Uh, give us an understanding heart and listening here. Whatever we learn from today's class, Lord, that we may understand it and bless Pastor, give her spirit of wisdom, understanding, and revelation the, by your Holy Spirit that she may taught us, Lord Jesus. Bless her, Lord, and bless each one of us, Lord. That we may receive and grasp the truth of the word of God, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Abhishek. So we were uh, on Wednesday looking at uh, Romans chapter 13. Uh, in Romans chapter 13, uh, Paul is basically uh, writing to the church at Rome. Uh, and he's telling them to, uh, you know, he's talking about the civic authorities, the government. Uh, he's asking the believers, he's instructing them uh, to submit to governing authorities. Um, and he's also telling them to uh, not to resist the governing authorities. And, uh, and he says, because they are uh, people who are appointed by God, they are in the institution of God. It's God's institution, institution that God has ordained. And he also calls them as uh, ministers of uh, God. Okay, so he's saying that uh, even as they're appointed by God, they're an institution of God, they're ministers of God. So as believers, what we must do, we must be subject to them, we must submit to them, not resist them, uh, not oppose or fight against them, do what is good, uh, pay our taxes, and also respect and honor them. And um, we looked at a few questions, uh, you know, uh, should we, uh, you know, submit uh, to authorities who are unjust, corrupt, and wicked leaders. We looked at a few uh, uh, points from what scripture tells us, what we understand uh, from scripture. And uh, we see that, you know, God has permitted them uh, to be in leadership, to come to that position, but not, uh, you know, it, what they're doing is not what God has permitted them. It's their own choice, but, you know, they would uh, be judged for their own uh, actions, but irrespective of uh, their own choices, uh, like we look at some examples in the Bible, God still goes ahead, sovereignly fulfills his plan and his um, uh, purposes. Okay, when we look at the people of the land, you know, the, how the people, the actions, the choices that the people of the land make influences those who come into authority. And we look at the importance of how we need to uh, teach uh, the upcoming generations uh, good, moral, uh, godly values and uh, standards and how important um, uh, that is. Okay. And we also look at to what extent we need to submit to governing authorities. Um, and then we, uh, we read verses 8 to 14. And in verse 8, Paul gives us uh, the key. You know, what is a key uh, uh, to submit to authorities, reminding himself of the Roman government and the wickedness and the cruelty of uh, how the emperor was ruling and persecuting the Christians. So he, Paul is telling the, uh, the believers, so what is the key? How do we submit? How, or, uh, how we don't resist them? How we need to just obey them? How we need to honor them? The key is love. Okay, Love must be our uh, standard. And then in verses 11 to 14, uh, Paul goes to talk about uh, the personal life of the believer, uh, the way uh, a believer needs to live. So we read verses 1 to 14. Uh, so Paul is basically saying in these verses, in verses uh, 11 to 14, he says, we need to live as one who is awake, not one who is uh, in deep sleep or slumber. That means we need to be alert. Um, 
why do we need to be alert? Because we need to be always constantly uh, alert uh, to put away the things or the deeds of uh, darkness and to put on the armor of light. Uh, we know that Paul uses this phrase, put on, uh, very frequently. We looked at it uh, in one of uh, the chapters that we had studied. Uh, we, he also writes, put on, uh, in the book of Colossians, uh, Ephesians, put on the armor of God. You know, uh, So he he's uses this phrase quite often, and uh, we see that you know, put on is something that you wear. You know, you put on something, you wear something. And when you wear something, everybody can see it, right? It's very obvious to uh, everyone. So in the same way, he says, you know, uh, get rid of the deeds of darkness, put on righteousness uh, as an armor. And then he goes on to uh, say in verses, um, in verse 14, he says, put on the Lord uh, Jesus Christ. Okay. Uh, before we look at uh, that, put on uh, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 13, he says, you know, let us uh, walk properly as in the day, not in rivalry, drunkenness, not in lewdness, lust, not in strife and uh, envy. So he's basically talking about walk decently, means walk honestly. And he says, avoid uh, revelry, avoid wild parties, drunkenness, uh, lewdness, indecency, sexual immorality. Uh, lust, sensuality, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, don't uh, give in to strife, quarrels, arguments, fighting, envy, and um, jealousy. And how can we, you know, walk properly? Okay, how can we get rid of the deeds of uh, darkness? It's not that easy, right? Because there are some weaknesses, some temptations that we have, and so Paul goes to give on the answer how we can walk properly. He says all of these things, you know, don't do all of these things. But how do we walk properly? We walk properly when we put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. So what does it mean, put on? Okay. It's, um, it just doesn't mean like, you know, uh, you put on a garment. But here it's basically saying be clothed with uh, Jesus Christ. That means be soaked, be completely covered, uh, fully attired um, uh, uh, with Jesus Christ. That means assimilate everything that is about Jesus, okay? Uh, the way he acts, the, his mannerism, his thinking, his lifestyle, his way of life, you know, put on that, uh, sorry, assimilate that, imitate that. Uh, why do we do that? When we do that, you know, when we put on Christ, then there would be no place for the flesh. There will be no place for anything that is indecent, uh, then we will be able to walk properly. Uh, and also, when we put on Christ, people can see us. Just like when you put on something, you put on a garment, you put on some things, people, it's obvious to everyone. People can notice it. People can see it. Okay? So the same way he says, you know, uh, put on Jesus Christ so that people can see you. And when you put on Jesus Christ, you will not give room for the flesh. Okay, don't give room uh, for the flesh to exercise uh, itself. Okay, uh, he says, make no provision for the flesh. Very interesting here. He says, make no provision. What is the meaning of provision? That means don't prepare, uh, you know, in, in uh, prepare beforehand, uh, even before you uh, face a temptation, even when you, you know, before. You face something, you know, prepare beforehand that you are not going to be doing that. Okay. So don't make any, uh, don't make any preparation beforehand to meet the sinful desires, but make preparation beforehand that you are not going to be indulging in certain things. So prepare beforehand ahead of time to deny the flesh and its sinful desires. Now, sometimes we think only when we face temptation, that, you know, we need to make a choice whether we need to do that or not do it. But actually here Paul is saying, you know, you prepare beforehand, prepare beforehand, make decisions beforehand uh, that what are the things of the flesh that you are going to deny? What are the things you are not going to uh, be part of? So don't give, when you prepare beforehand, you don't give the flesh any opportunity. 
okay, uh, you are already nailing, crucifying the things of the flesh. You are already depriving the flesh of any chance it has to make its um, way. Uh, and you say no even before the flesh makes its request. So the flesh is not crying out. Okay? But when the flesh knows that you have not made any preparations, you have not made any stand, then your flesh will cry out. And sometimes, you know, the, the urge, the desire is so strong that, you know, our will also, you know, we can easily get sucked in. But we make preparations beforehand. You think ahead of time, uh, you know, what are the things of the flesh that you are not going to give an opportunity, you are not going to give a room for. Okay, let's, uh, you know, let's look at a couple of examples. Now, for example, uh, you're traveling alone. Okay, uh, you're traveling alone and uh, you have to stay in a hotel room and you have access to TV, uh, you know, um, and you have a lot of time to pass. So you can just flip over the channels, but, you know, you can, you've made your choice beforehand. I'm going to just put on the TV to watch news or to watch a cricket match or a football match uh, but if there is a, a movie that comes in which is not a godly movie which is not the right kind of movie that you should be watching you've already made your choice beforehand that you are not going to watch that movie so you're just going to flip and see you know whether the the news there you got the news you put on the tv or uh, you know you uh, uh, you just uh, you know sweeping going to the channels uh, to see whether there's a football match, a cricket match. And if it's not there, you just switch it off and you do something else. You read a book or something like that. Uh, so if you're not somebody who's watching TV, then this does not become a problem for you. Because you go to a hotel room, you're not somebody who's interested in TV at all because you don't have any interest. You already know what you're supposed to be doing. You're, you're reading a book or you have some work to complete. Uh, you are doing that. Now, for example, you know ahead of time that um, all of your uh, colleagues at office, you know, are going out on a Friday and they've all decided to go to the pub. Okay. Uh, it's a happy hour. They're all going out to the pub uh, and they're saying, okay, why don't you come with us? Okay. But you plan to go with them, but you've already made up in your mind that you are not going to drink any alcohol or beer. You're just going to order for Sprite or Coca-Cola or Thumbs Up or whatever. And, uh, you know, all of them are going to be smoking, but you are not. Uh, and you're just going there so that you can also set a godly example, just be with your friends. Uh, sometimes as a male uh, colleague, you're going out with a female colleague just to protect them because, you know, most of the female colleagues get drunk. You just want to be there to uh, protect them, uh, safeguard them. Uh, just going out with your female colleagues so that uh, they all are getting drunk and uh, you are not getting drunk, so you are planning to drive them all back home, you know, in your car uh, uh, safely. Okay, so um, you know you you are just going there for that party, not because you're interested, but you know you have other agendas. But you've already thought in your mind this is things that I'm not going to do. Okay, uh, you've already planned things. You already have seen how things work in the corporate. So when you're going for a outing with your friends. In the corporate, all of your team is going for an outing. You know what you're not going to be doing with the, the female folks, or if you're female, what you're not going to be doing with the male folks, and all of those things, how you're going to stand back, you know, uh, live a godly lifestyle. So you don't make a decision when you are, your flesh is crying out, but before that, you already have made uh, no provisions to, you know, feed your flesh, the carnal nature, the desires of your flesh and your so every day we need to put on Jesus and every day we make no provisions for the flesh so it's not just when you're faced with temptation like Joseph faced uh, temptation it's not as big as that it can be even in small things so every every day you know we put on Jesus uh, that means in every little situation we are making a choice whether to give to our flesh or um, to give into the spirit filled nature okay so that's how paul ends uh, this he talks about love and then he goes uh, back to what he was be talking about christian living godly living and he tells them certain things not to do how to be awake how to be uh, to discern the times and seasons what they're going through what they need to do and then he says you know 
put on the Lord Jesus Christ, but also make no provision for the flesh. Think before anything. Okay, so that is uh, chapter 13. Anyone has any questions? Any comments you want to make? Anything that you want me to explain again? Okay, there's no questions. I don't see any questions. Um, there are no questions, then we move on to chapter 14, if that's okay. Is that fine? Okay. Okay, in chapter 14, Paul is talking about how to relate to one another. He's talking again about Christian living. He's continuing uh, to talk on Christian living. Uh, there are two key points he highlights in Romans chapter 14. The first one is don't judge another believer. Uh, basically, the believer here uh, he's talking about is the one who is expressing his faith differently from you. And the second thing is uh, he says don't become a stumbling block. Okay, uh, he says live in such a way that uh, uh, that your expression of your faith shouldn't cause someone else to stumble in their faith. So basically he's talking about two things. The first thing is don't judge another brother, uh, you know, uh, or another believer, how they are expressing their faith. Each one can express their faith differently. And then secondly, he says, don't become a stumbling block. Let not your faith, your expression of faith, how you live your life, your faith walk with God, things that you do should not cause uh, be a stumbling block to somebody else's faith. And then he puts uh, things in the context of he puts it in you know, in the context of certain things that uh, were relevant for them in their time. So he's basically talking about expressing their faith uh, in the kind of food uh, they eat uh, or what kind of drink they should be drinking. Um, and also he's talking about you know observing certain days as sacred. Uh, so in that context, he's talking. So he's talking in the context of food, uh, drinking, and also uh, the context of uh, you know observing certain days as uh, sacred and as holy. Now today, in our context, uh, you know, you know, observing certain days as holy uh, and food may not be a major issue like it was when Paul was writing the church at Rome, but uh, the principle. Uh, or, uh, you know, uh, the truth that he's trying to bring out here can still apply to our day in our situations, with the things that we face. Um, and, uh, you know, they can uh, we can apply uh, these truths, these things, the principles that he's bringing about in our own context today. Okay. So with this uh, brief background, let's look at Romans chapter 14. Uh, then somebody read verses uh, 1 to um uh, 13 please Romans chapter 14 verses 1 to 13. can i read pastor yes, sure asha as for the one who is weak in faith welcome him but not to quarrel over opinions one person believes he may eat anything while the weak person eats only vegetables let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the past and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats for god has welcomed him who are you to pass judgment on the ser servant of another it is before his owner own master that he stands or falls and he will be upheld for the lord is able to make him stand one person esteems one day as better than another while another esteems all day alike each one should be fully convinced in his own mind the one who observes the day observe it in honor of the lord the one who eats it's in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord, and give thanks to God. 
for none of us lived to himself, none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we will live to we will live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or you? Why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. Thank you, Asha. So in this first section of uh, this chapter, uh, Romans chapter 14, um, you know, Paul is concerned about people who are weak in faith. So who are these people who are weak in faith? Basically are those who are new to the faith, uh, new believers uh, who have come newly joined the church. So he's talking about them. Okay, he says, welcome them, okay, but don't go about arguing and disputing uh, with them about, you know, which days to observe and what kind of food to eat. Now, it was becoming very difficult in all of the churches, and Paul is writing most of his epistles. He's writing to the churches. You know, he's very concerned because uh, many of these Jewish believers who come into the church, you know, they are telling the Gentiles that they have to follow uh, all of the Jewish rituals, the certain days, um, and also, you know, they have to, you know, observe the uh, the circumcision ritual, uh, the kind of meat to eat, the kosher meat, and all of those things. Um, and also, they were trying to talk about, you know, telling people they have to follow Jewish mythologies and fables and all of these things, stories which, uh, you know, so all of their forefathers. And it was becoming like a burden for the Gentiles. It was not necessary for them to grow in their uh, faith. And there was a lot of arguing and disputing and discussion around all of these things. Uh, so Paul is addressing this uh, to the church at Rome as uh, well. Okay, so he says when when a new believer comes, no, welcome them, make them feel welcome to church. Don't go about disputing, arguing with them which days to observe, what food to eat, and all of those things. Now in today's context. You know, all of these uh, about food and certain days and circumcision rituals and all of that may not be relevant in our context. But what do you think will be relevant in our context? It might be, you know, about the kind of clothes. I know people have, um, you know, uh, spoken about this in churches of the kind of clothes people wear, whether you should wear jewelry or not, whether women in our context, in your context, whether women should cover their head or not whether you know, women should sit on one side, the men should sit on one side, uh, and all of those things, okay? Uh, whether you should go to the movies, uh, you know, or you shouldn't be watching movies. Um, so, you know, but Paul says these are all things that you should not be disputing about, arguing about, and he calls these as doubtful things. What are these doubtful things, the kind of food that you're going to eat, uh, you know, observing certain days? So he says these things should not be argued out okay don't argue about these doubtful things so that these doubtful things basically what you eat and the ways you observe so in essence what paul is basically saying in these verses that have been read to us is he says you know let each one be fully convinced in his own mind was fine so you make up your mind you know what you want to eat whether you want to eat meat or you want to just eat vegetables you know if you want to eat meat you just keep you eat meat now, you want to eat uh, vegetables, you just eat vegetables. But if you're eating vegetables and you see another believer eating meat, you don't judge them. You know, you don't criticize them. You don't argue with them. If you are eating meat and another uh, believer is just eating vegetables, you don't judge them. You don't condemn them. You don't argue with them. And also about uh, the, the days that you keep sacred, you know. Uh, 
So he says, one person can keep one day sacred, another person can keep all days uh, sacred. Okay. So he's saying that there is uh, in the New Testament, or for New Testament believers, there's no such thing as, you know, which is the right food to eat, which is not the right food to eat, uh, which is a sacred day, which is not a sacred day. But he says, you make up your mind. And once you make up your mind, then there are two things that you need to do. The first thing is you need to do is don't judge somebody else what they are doing and what they are following or what they are not doing and what they are not following. You want to follow this, you just follow it for yourself uh, because you're doing this is unto the Lord. It's between you and the Lord. Others are not doing it. Don't go judging that they are not spiritual, that you are super spiritual. They're not doing what is right and all of those things. Uh, okay. And then that is what he says in verse 10. He says, but why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So he says, why are you judging or showing contempt as though you are more spiritual because you eat certain kind of food, you observe certain kind of days? He says, whatever we are doing, whatever food we are eating, whatever we are drinking, whatever days we are observing, ultimately, whatever we do, we do it for God. Okay, And God is going to be the judge. What is going to God, God judge us about? Our motives. Why we are doing what we are doing. Okay. For God, motive is more important than what we really do. So each one, he says, will have to give an account of their own life. So you don't judge because there is a judge. He will judge. He is the rightful judge who can uh, judge. The second thing he says, once you make up your mind what you want to do, the second thing he says, don't become a stumbling block to others okay how you express your faith should not become a stumbling block to uh, to others okay so he says in verse 14 i know and i'm convinced by the lord jesus this is nothing unclean of itself but to him who considers anything to be unclean to him it is unclean okay so then he goes on to explain in verse 14 onwards you know how in what areas we shouldn't be uh, a stumbling block uh, so, and how we need to express our faith, in what ways we need to express our faith, how we need to be careful to explain, uh, express our faith so that we don't become a stumbling block for others, okay? So we look at the verses 14 uh, to verses uh, 23. Before we go ahead, anyone has any doubts? Verses uh, 14 to verse 23. Before that, if you have any doubts about verse 1 to 10, just very briefly I've explained because there's nothing much in detail. Okay, any questions from verses 1 to 10? No? Okay, then can somebody uh, read verses 14 to the end of the chapter, verse 23, slowly, and uh, someone else can read, please? Anyone? Right. Yes, please go ahead, Mankey. Verse 14. I know and I'm convinced that by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. But to him who consider anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your, with your food, the one for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let your good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who saves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. It is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine 
nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or he's made weak. Do you have faith? Have it to, have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what is he approves, but he who doubt is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith, but whatever is not from faith is sin. Thank you, Mangi. So Paul is basically talking about the second part where he's saying, you know, um, uh, you, know you make up your decisions, what you want to eat, drink, what days you want to observe. Uh, but he says, even as you do that, you know, uh, don't become a stumbling block to others how you express your faith uh, should not become a stumbling block to others. So here Paul is basically or specifically talking about eating meat and drinking wine. And in essence, what Paul is saying is, uh, when you are in Christ, you are free to eat what you want. Okay, You have freedom to eat whatever you want. So just paraphrasing what Paul uh, is saying, uh, Paul is basically saying, I want uh, to be careful that I don't grieve my brother because of food. If what I'm doing is an offense to another, means it's an offense to a weaker brother or someone who's weak in our faith, basically someone who does not understand the freedom we have in Christ, then I will be careful not to grieve my brother. So basically paraphrasing what Paul says, Paul is saying, so we have the freedom, you know, what we want to eat, what we want to drink, what uh, certain days we want to observe. It's between you and the Lord. We have the freedom in Christ. But, you know, uh, when we exercise our freedom in front of other brothers and sisters, we need to be also careful because they don't understand the freedom we have in Christ. They just new to their faith. They don't understand this. So what we do can uh, become a hindrance to their faith because they look at us as somebody who is mature in the Lord, somebody who's, you know, uh, spiritual. Um, and so, you know, he's saying, you know, then be careful. Because why should you be careful? Because they don't understand your uh, freedom. And whatever you do can become a stumbling block to their uh, faith. And we don't want that to uh, happen. So what is the offense? He's saying here, uh, you know, it can become an offense. Uh, basically, he's saying the weaker brother does not understand the freedom we have in Christ. So for him, this is not the right thing to do. This is not the right way to do. This is not the right lifestyle. This is not the right way of living. This is not the right food to eat. Uh, this should not be happening to a believer. So if what I do is going to weaken his faith in Christ, uh, then Paul says, I will not eat or drink. So that I don't want to become a stumbling block to his faith okay so paul is saying don't do it in public and open you know where we have all of these uh, weaker brothers new believers who come if you want to do it at home it's okay you know because your family understands uh, you you know you are you you know what you're doing as far as you do what is right in god's uh, side but when it comes in the public you know sometimes it's okay for us not to do certain things not just to hold on to say okay, this is my freedom they have to learn they have to understand when will they grow up no you know as as we as mature believers we need to be careful uh, we need to conduct our lives in, in such a way so that you know we don't become a stumbling block to uh, to our uh, weaker brothers those who are new in the uh, faith so Paul says, you know, we have this freedom in Christ because he says the kingdom of God is not about. What is the kingdom of God not about? It's not about eating and drinking. Okay, the kingdom of God is not about uh, eating and drinking. Uh, verse seventeen. Okay, but what is the kingdom of God about? Righteousness, Righteousness peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So he said there are bigger things that are more important than food, than what you eat and drink. What are the bigger things? Righteousness, peace, and joy. Okay. When 
so he's basically saying when you are in a right relationship with God, righteousness means what? In your right standing with God, in a right relationship with God, you know, basically what you eat will also be right. So what you watch will also be right. How you live will also be right. And he's already told us in, in, uh, in chapter 13, you know, put on Christ so that you will not make provisions for the flesh. So all of that will come when you put on Christ. That means when you put on this righteousness, because you know the righteousness of Christ is being imputed upon us. The righteousness of God is being put into our account. Okay, we are not righteous, but it's Christ's righteousness that has been imputed upon us, means which has been put into our account. So when we put on Christ, it's natural that you know we will behave like Christ, we will follow his thinking, his mannerisms, his way of life, uh, the way he does things. And that is going to be godly. That's going to bring about righteousness. And that righteousness, a right standing with God is going to lead to peace. That means whatever we do is going to become being pleased to uh, with with all of them around us. And it's going to edify believers, going to bring about joy and happiness in the fellowship. And it's not going to bring about strife and division okay so the key here is about pursuing what is the bigger things so paul is saying don't get on get don't get caught up with all of these rituals basically you know he's telling the, the jewish people they're so ritualistic right uh you have to do this you have to do this you have to follow these days you have to you know wear these tassels you have to wear these uh, uh, bands on your head which which is talking about the commandments uh, you have to stand on the street and pray like this. You have to stand in the assembly and in the temple and pray like this. So all is becoming such a ritual, okay? Circumcision, food to eat, and all of those things. But he says that there are more important things than just this because he's already discussed in depth that it's not the law, you know, that's going to give us uh, the right standing. It's the grace of God. By grace through faith, okay? So... Uh, so he says there are bigger things, and one of the bigger things pursue righteousness, peace, and uh, joy. So he says, you know, if my exercise of my freedom can cause a new believer either to be offended or be weakened in their faith in Christ, then he says, in that context, I will not eat what I'm supposed to eat, and I will not drink what I am supposed to be uh, drinking. Okay, so he says. Um, you know, uh, it's it's good neither to eat meat or drink wine or do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. Don't do it uh, in there or when they are watching you, they're seeing you, verse 21, uh, because it can destroy uh, the work of God for the sake of food. Don't destroy the work of God for the sake of food, verse 20. Okay, uh, he says, all things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense when does it become a sin it's okay as new testament believers it's okay for us to eat anything okay but when does it become uh, an offense it's when does it become evil when that what we are doing is becoming offense a stumbling block to somebody else's thing then it becomes evil how does it become evil because it's causing a fellow brother to stumble in their faith to go away in their walk with um, God, or also to give them a license to sin, so they can say, "Hey, look at that brother. You know, he's uh, the, look at that sister. She's uh, mature in the faith, and she eats such food. She drinks wine. Uh, uh, you know, she doesn't follow all of these things. Then, you know, I'm just doing this sin, and you're holding me accountable for uh, for that. Why don't you hold him or her accountable? So it just gives people license for." sin so he says you know um, if what i'm doing uh, eating drinking is going to cause an offense and i won't do it because i don't want to give it as a license for other people to for themselves also to indulge in um, sin okay so he says whatever you do it do it happily do it uh, in connection with god you know as long as well, your actions don't condemn you okay the action should not condemn you. If your actions condemns you, that means what you're doing is not honorable, is not holy, is not righteous, because, you know, um, he has already explained to us that, you know, our conscience also bears 
witness. Our conscience also testifies, uh, also makes known the mind of God, the things of uh, God to us. So if your conscience is not approving of something, if your conscience is condemning you, that means you know what you're doing is not right in God's sight. Better not do it because it's not something that he will approve of. Okay, and also whatever you do, don't doubt. You know, um, if you, uh, for he says he who doubts is condemned if he eats, but because he does not eat from faith, for whatever is not from faith is sin. So don't doubt. You know, uh, sometimes uh, when uh, you know in our context, uh, uh, you know, Paul is saying, should they eat food offered to idols? Now this this question has been raised a couple of times. Now uh, we just had a, a Hindu festival Diwali, okay? Uh, and in Diwali, you know, our neighbors bring sweets. They bring some things that they have made at home. Uh, but Paul is saying, uh, you know, for your conscience sake and for the person's conscience sake, don't raise up questions. And now don't ask them, did you offer the sweet to your idol? Did you do puja? Did you do all of these things? You know, you've not seen them doing it. If you've not seen it for your conscience sake and their conscience sake, just bless it and eat it. You know, just be happy. Don't doubt. If you doubt, then, you know, you might as well don't eat it. Don't doubt it. You know, he says, you just eat it. Oh, wow, it's tasty. Uh, it's very nice. Uh, some nice good eat, some nice good snacks. Just enjoy it. But if you're somebody who's very doubtful, better not to eat. Okay? And don't even ask questions. But if you, Paul says, if you see that being offered to idols, then for your conscience sake and the other person's conscience sake, just refuse it very, very nicely. Uh, say you don't want it because you've already seen. And then if you eat it still, then your conscience pricks you, then it is, you know, sin. Because whatever is not in faith is in sin. But then you bring it and give it to you. You've not seen it. You're very excited to eat. You're very happy to eat some snacks. Just go ahead and eat it in faith. Just bless it. Thank them. And just enjoy the snack. Okay. So in this context, he's talking about food and wine in certain you know, days. But uh, even in our uh, present day, you know, there are various challenges that we uh, face as believers. Uh, there are certain ways people dress up and come to church, you know, uh, because they have, some of them have long hair, men have long hair, put ponytails. Some people wear shorts and come to church. You know, some people wear, um, uh, you know, heels or they put up makeup and jewelry, but we don't judge them right we don't judge them but uh, the way we dress you know should not become a stumbling block to somebody else's faith right uh, like if a, if a, a believer comes from some other christian from a non christian background and he sees this person dressed up uh, in shorts coming to church or uh, uh, you know in 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 a you know with uh, you know our bodies just showing uh, uh very skimpy clothes that we are wearing what is a person going to think you know there's no godliness in this church the person may not want to come back to this church so you know in every way we need to um see if you know the way we dress the way we eat the way we what we wear uh, everything is it godly it's god honoring uh, or it's it, and it's not going to be a stumbling block to anyone else Okay, so that is what he's basically talking about in uh, chapter 14. So it's a good time to, you know, uh, in retrospect, just look at our own lives, see areas um, uh, where what we are doing, uh, you know, uh, because people are always watching us. I remember, you know, as we went recently for a, a wedding and it was one of our uh, 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 members in our team and in that wedding they had um, you know they had dance and all that and of course they played some uh, they had a uh, just before the wedding day they had something called Sangeet you know it's a music time uh, it's very famous in North India uh, I come from a Gujarati culture so I know that uh, it happens in our Gujarati culture uh, where everybody is invited and then there's music playing and everybody's dancing you know, you don't have to invite people to dance. They will dance the entire whole night. You just have to ask them to stop because, uh, you know, they as Gujaratis, we just love to dance. But the, the songs that are played are all Christian songs and all Christian dance tunes. 
um, so there's no movie sound split. Uh, and then when I went to this movie, it it I mean when I went to this uh, wedding, which is one of our team members, um, you know, uh, it clicked with me very excitingly because it was my culture. But I realized that there were all these uh, movie songs, and I also realized that you know there were uh, uh, some church members who had come, and there was a family especially who had gone to this very strict Orthodox church where they were not doing all of not in the sense of orthodox, but the, the pastor was very strict and, um, you know, they came from a different faith and they were saying, you know, did you approve of this, this dancing and all of that? And then I realized, thank God, I didn't go and dance. <laughs> I should be so careful because I was just so mindful, okay, you know, people are watching you. And suddenly you are so excited about this wedding and you're just thinking about your own culture where, it, you know, I've danced in all of my cousin sisters and cousin brothers' weddings and all. And I was just so eager to jump up and dance, but I didn't. I just sat down there and I was so glad because this family was actually noticing. And, uh, you know, having this title of pastor, I thank God that I didn't do it because, uh, but then I had to tell them, see, in our culture, it also happens, uh, but we also we, we don't have new movie songs. They were totally uh, disappointed because this was the first Christian marriage they were what they had come to witness and they had all of these things. But I told them this is kind of the culture that is in North India, uh, but they were not too happy about it. And we also had, uh, uh, they served as a toast, you know, a champagne, and they said it was non-alcoholic. Uh, and the waiter just left it at my table, and then uh, this family was just sitting right behind, and their eyes were popping out uh, <laughs> because it, the champagne glass was on my table. And, uh, you know, so you know, people are constantly watching, you do not know. And uh, it was said that this was just, uh, you know, champagne, but it was non-alcoholic. But for this couple, it was, you know, whatever. It was not to be served. It was not something that is called honoring. So we have different people in different mindsets. Uh, we need to be sensitive. Um, we can't say, okay, they have to understand, they have to learn, they have to grow, they have to adjust. But we learn to be sensitive. Um, and you know um, so that we do not become a stumbling block to others okay so just like to stop there anyone has any thoughts anything you like to say anything you like to share very quiet today class no thoughts no questions or Romans chapter 13 and 14. Uh, what, one thing I can say, I can say or learn from, from this is that, uh, yeah, the culture is big, it's big things. Like everywhere we go, we, we try to translate the Bible according to, to our culture. Like here, um, they're more wine than water. So, like lunchtime, people drink wine. Uh, supper, people drink wine. Uh, at a gathering, uh, like for example, like men gathering, just men gathering, to be uh, at a bride where they're barbecuing, to be uh, a bottle of wine. Or, so it's wine doesn't seem as a as a sin. So drunkness is is a, is a sin. Is bad. Is condemned. However, like drinking a glass of wine, it's it's is normal. It is a way of life. So, yeah, it is. Yeah, I know. From, from, <laughs> from, 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 from what you just spoke now. Yes, thank you, uh, Mangi, for sharing. Uh, so many people even point out to Jesus turning the water into wine, uh, but many of them to safeguard uh, the Christians. They say it's not. Uh, uh, you know, fermented wine, it is just grape juice. <laughs> so, so Jesus was actually talking about grape juice. Uh, we need to be very careful, yes. I remember, you know, um, in children's church, we, we are giving out communion elements. And so we say, you know, this wafer, that sometimes we say wine. Now I'd be very careful. I never say wine uh, because uh, one of our uh, children's uh, church, you know, uh, uh, child, the Christmas party in school, all of his other friends says, hey, you know, in your church, they all drink wine, so for the party, why don't you bring a bottle of wine? So he's gone and bought a bottle of wine, 
and uh, he thinks this is okay because we serve great you know we serve bread and wine uh, part of communion and uh, it became a problem the 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 boys were caught and who brought the wine so this child was caught and then he goes and tells the principal you know we do this the parents were called like the parents come and uh, you know share this with me and then i was just so shocked you know then i stopped saying uh, wine i say grape juice from that time onwards so our children know it is uh, wafer and grape juice uh, which symbolizes the broad body and the blood of jesus christ but otherwise children think it's okay to drink wine but yes, the Bible tells us in place, various places, I'll kind of post it because I don't want to take your time, uh, you know, how we should not be drinking uh, wine because, uh, you know, how it can get into drunkenness. We don't want to get into that stage where it can get addicted. But I know many cultures, they do drink wine. Many of them uh, just, just drink, but they're in control. But many of them do get addicted. Uh, so, you know, uh, just better than not to venture into it. And I know in many cultures, yes, they... Uh, they do drink wine. Yes, thank you, Mangi, for sharing. But I can just post that on the on the stream page, or can take a good read at it because we don't have the time, and I don't want to keep you all waiting. Okay, okay. Thank you all for joining class. Um, I'll see you on Wednesday. Um, I hope you all are okay with the assessment dates. Uh, next assessment is November seventeen, and the other one is on November fourteen. Okay. Charles says it is well past it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for joining class. Anyone has uh, anything? Yes, say. Uh, with the, the, the assessment, I don't know if the yeah, the assessment that you gave us initially, I, I think there are some questions. Are, are you still going to go through to see? Because there's some questions that I got, but they it was marked wrong. I don't know if you're going to still go through them. Yes, you mean the fill in the blank? Yes, the fill in the yes, blank. Yes. The fill in the blanks, I'm going to go through everything and then uh, manually, you know, uh, give you the marks. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. All right. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Pastor. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Bye then. Have a good uh, weekend. God bless you all.